there's new evidence of Israeli human rights abuses in Gaza. An Israeli non-governmental organization called Breaking the Silence says 60 Israeli soldiers have testified that they were ordered to kill everyone they saw in the most recent action in Gaza last year. Uh, one Israeli soldier said that all those engaged in this action, called Operation Protective Edge, were ordered to fire everywhere on the basis that every Palestinian was a terrorist, regardless of whether or not those Palestinians were armed. Israeli police have also engaged with other ethnic groups, such as black Ethiopians, who have protested against what they regard as Israeli racism and police brutality. Many draw similarities with police racism and brutality in the US, most recently in Baltimore. Elsewhere, Palestine's envoy to the United Nations wants justice regarding Israel's persistent abuse of Palestinian children, with human rights activists calling for sanctions and criminal proceedings, and the Human Rights Watch group backing up these claims in its report called Ripe for Abuse. Even the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East peace process has renewed calls on Israel to end its blockade on the Gaza Strip. All this begins to explain the very considerable civilian death toll and suffering thanks to Israeli action in Gaza. Are there similarities between police racism and brutality in Israel and the United States? What is causing the massive civilian casualties when Israel launches its military offensives against Gaza? And what would it take to get the international community to take a stand on Israel's actions? These are the simple questions we sought to answer. And we began by considering the report by that non-governmental organization, which states that 60 soldiers from Israel have testified they were ordered to kill everyone they saw during the war on Gaza last year. Should we regard Israel as inhumane or dangerous? That's the question we put to the American public. I just feel like war is bad to begin with. Like there's no reason to, you know, hurt anybody or like I don't feel like that's, nothing's worth that personally. Well, of course they're dangerous. They're soldiers, but it is a war. So I think that it is dangerous. Uh, I believe that according to the laws of war, the Israelis may have violated them if they had just killed people indiscriminately. And the answer is going to depend on the facts and circumstances of each case. Uh, if they were killing militants, then due to the fact that they were in a war zone, this is probably not in violation of the laws of war. But if they were just killing civilians, then that would be inhumane. I think it just has to do with being um, brainwashed and just like uh, when there's a large leader just brainwashing groups of people and they think that that's what they're supposed to do. Um, I don't know. I guess it's just a personal choice for each soldier. Based off of the sentence that you just shared, it sounds like there is some miscommunication within self-love. You know, we really have to learn how to love ourselves. And the question is, how do you learn how to love yourself? Well, how would you want to love someone else that is related to you, that treats you good? Or how would you treat a young child? Would you do this to a young child who's new to the world and, and doesn't know anything about the world? You want to be caring and loving towards yourself first so that you can learn how to do it towards others. I don't really know much about Israel, but I think in general, that's not really okay to do. You know, it's kind of wrong. I think that everyone should have the right to live and that's just, I don't know. With so many Israeli soldiers adding their personal testimony about the shoot to kill policy in Gaza, should Israel primarily be regarded as inhumane or dangerous? We asked our experts. Well, this, this means that Israel is acting inhumanely and dangerously. I mean, the, Israel's own soldiers have testified that they were told to kill any Palestinians they saw in Gaza as a matter of policy, not just Palestinian fighters, civilians as well. And this is a clear, uh, flagrant violation of international law. So yes, Israel is being inhumane and dangerous in, exact, in its actions. Well, the latest um, report um, issued by an Israeli NGO breaking the silence, um, testimonies collected by the soldiers show the grave violations of international human rights 
and this also shows Israel's disregard to human uh, uh, lives. And I think what is, what is more important is who gave the orders, uh, the rule of engagement. Um, the soldiers received these orders from their commanders. And I think the target of um, the Israeli military uh, campaign against Gaza, uh, whether it's the first, second or third, is to destroy Gaza's infrastructure, to send Gaza back to the Stone Age. Israeli soldiers have also revealed their instructions were to shoot immediately, regardless of whether or not a Palestinian was armed. We asked the American public how they felt this might link with the high number of civilian casualties every time Israel attacks Gaza. Um, I think it's the same as when uh, like America was at war with Vietnam. You know, it wasn't a matter of killing the people fighting you, but just anyone. It was the general population. So you would link it because obviously they're killing civilians without thinking because they were told to do that. If the soldiers were told to shoot indiscriminately without any notion of there being a weapon, then yes, that's probably a violation of the laws of war. However, if the soldiers were told that the Palestinians often hide weapons, then that might have been a prudent course of action. Well, if they're being told to shoot someone, whether they're armed or unarmed, then that'd probably go for every instance, wouldn't it? Well, I wouldn't link it at all. Uh, every time uh, there is a war, people die. So, doesn't link. Civilians, like, it's just uncalled for. I don't think that, like, lives shouldn't be lost, in my eyes, for if there is no reason to be at all, so. Okay, if civilian, I mean, civilians be, being killed is never a good thing. Like, that's never right or okay. With a shoot to kill policy towards Palestinians, whether armed or not, what is the likely connection between this and the high level of civilian casualties? We put that question to our experts. Well, if, if Israeli soldiers are told to shoot Palestinians and not even to ask questions later, but to not ask any questions at all, of course there is going to be a high civilian death toll. And this is shown in every single attack against Gaza that Israel has launched. The vast majority of Palestinian casualties and fatalities have been civilian. And this is absolutely no surprise when Israeli soldiers are told to basically kill any person they see. Uh, without regard to whether they're armed or not. And this is also the, the case when it has invaded Lebanon in the past as well. So clearly, um, Israel has no, absolutely no regard for civilian life in these, in these conflicts that it wages. The Israeli military um, known to has the, one of the most advanced technology um, in the world. And they can distinguish between a civilian target and a military target. And I think the purpose of flattened um, wiping out entire neighborhoods or to kill civilians is to um, you know spread fear and uh, outrage against the Palestinian civilians of Gaza to put the blame on the Palestinian resistance factions and I think also it's um, a heavy blow so that the Palestinian resistance factions could think again or twice before they could retaliate um, towards any Israeli violations or attacks. Israeli police have also clashed with Ethiopians who have protested against the Israeli regime's racism and police brutality. We asked the American public to consider what parallels they saw between this and police racism and brutality in the US. I would say that uh, if uh, a police force acts uh, as a government force, it will have to do whatever government says. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just the way it is. But obviously, whenever you have a police that, is, that acts like, according to some orders, they will do things that they are instructed to. So I would say that those are linked, but uh, I, you cannot blame like, people themselves, those police people. I think it's hard to see the difference at all. It's very clear. Every country has the sort of racist cops towards a certain group, whether it's you know, white cops on black cops, black cops on, on uh, white men. You know, it exists no matter what. So the existence re resides in between one group, again, you know, attacking another group because that's what they're told. They have the power to do it and people are going to abuse the power when they have the chance. It's not right. We, we have the same type of problem here in America where the, the blacks are allegedly uh, being killed by the police at epidemic rates. And the only way that that's going to be fixed is through social change. And the same thing applies to Israel. I think any type of brutality or police brutality is wrong. Um, 
I don't think that it should ever be used against anybody innocent. Okay, well, I know in the United States that there's a lot going on. Um, this is a really huge issue for everyone. And um, I don't believe that it's ever right, but I also don't know how racial it is completely. Like, I feel that if someone was doing the wrong thing, the cop wouldn't just shoot someone for no reason. You're in a source of power, so you're supposed to protect. You're not supposed to attack the people that you're supposed to be protecting. So, in general, that's just not okay. <laughs> Given that Israeli police forces are clashing with groups such as Ethiopians, we wondered if our experts could make a comparison of police racism and brutality in Israel and the United States. Israel should be punished for child abuse in the same way that any other country would be punished for similar violations. This, this is the crux of the problem, is that Israel complains that it is treated differently to other countries in the world, that people single Israel out for, for censor. But actually the opposite is the case. Israel is treated differently, but for, the, for precisely the opposite reason, is that it is treated and it treats itself as above the law, that it's allowed to, to, uh, to violate Palestinian rights with impunity, and this is the very problem. It must be treated and censored and sanctioned, just as any other country would be for the same violations. Whenever Israel faces an internal crisis, Israel rushes to um, export this internal problem by attacking the Palestinian territories, especially the besieged Gaza Strip. And I think the brutality of the Israeli police is not less um, uh, merciful than those who are suffering the brutality of police in the United States. I think uh, Israelis are worried, Israeli politicians are worried that this phenomenon that is on the rise, the racism or discrimination against non-white Jews, could actually flip the table. So um, I think uh, without focusing on the Palestinian resistance or putting the blame on the resistance, then the um, Israeli politicians would face the consequences internally. That's why they try to uh, incite the Israeli public in a way or another by convincing them that their, their only enemy is the Palestinians. The Palestinian envoy to the United Nations has demanded justice over Israel's persistent abuse of Palestinian children. How should Israel be punished for this child abuse? We asked the American public. Child abuse is wrong on any level by anybody. Um, a lot of people around the world do it. I don't agree with it no matter who it is, no matter what country, no matter what person, so. Child abuse is never okay, in my personal opinion. Um, obviously, like, discipline is fine, but child, child abuse is never good. I think that first they should just all sit down and talk to each other, and uh, then figure out uh, what should be taken. Like, it's, it shouldn't be just a punishment or whatever. They first should figure out how to stop it from happening. Punishment won't help like whoever already was hurt. I mean, it depends on the circumstances of the case. If they're using child soldiers, that's definitely against the laws of war. That's inhumane. Children shouldn't be fighting in a war. But uh, that's the first I've heard of that issue. And if it is substantiated, then they should be sanctioned by the UN. Hmm. You know, I think it's just a question of how would you want to treat your own personal child? And as it relates to child abuse, are you abusing your child? Is this the way that you would want to be treated? You know, other countries, whether I'm right or wrong, I'm not really quite sure, have used child labor and abused their children. And I feel like being brought up in America, I've been lucky. You know, I was raised, I got to choose what I want to do, what I didn't want to do. And I think that forcing a child to do something, especially hard labor or hard work, is definitely wrong. They're just a small child. They're innocent. They haven't even grown and it's gonna affect them for the rest of their life and you know it can it can scar them definitely they should be punished the same as anybody else who hurts innocent human beings especially children I mean you know if you're an adult you probably did something messed up at some point to deserve some kind of something but when you're a child you know they should be tried the people involved should be tried and they should be jailed and sentenced to whatever the I mean I don't know Israeli laws but I would assume that they would go to jail for a long time, as they should. What is the opinion of our experts regarding the persistent abuse of Palestinian children by Israel? Here's what they said. 
The problem with the blockade of Gaza is, is not necessarily that the international community is unwilling to stand up to Israel. It is that Israel's allies, particularly in the West, um, hamper any efforts to sanction Israel for the blockade. Um, this means the US threat of vetoes in the Security Council. This means the US, Britain, Germany, other countries in the West particularly, um, giving diplomatic cover to Israel, providing military aid, economic concessions, all these things allow Israel not just to blockade Gaza, but to occupy and colonize Palestine with impunity. And until these allies are willing to say enough is enough, then unfortunately we're not going to see any, any action from governments. So what needs to happen is grassroots movements, such as the boycott, di divestment and sanctions movement against Israel, such as pursuing Israel in the International Criminal Court, there, there have to be ways of pursuing Israel outside of governmental levels, because as we've seen, governments and the United Nations are basically hampered and hopeless in terms of really dealing with Israel as it should. Well, over the years, we saw during Israel's uh, wars on Gaza, the first, the second, the third, um, civilian casualties were the victims, um, infrastructure was destroyed. Uh, and I think what is more important than, you know, punishing Israeli officials is how to prevent another catastrophe, how to prevent more atrocities, because we see that Israel is enjoying a culture of impunity. We have not seen any of the Israeli army officials or army generals was taken to court. So I think accountability is a must in this case. The United Nations Special Coordinator for the Middle East has renewed calls for Israel to end its blockade of the Gaza Strip. What do you think it would take for the international community to stand up to Israel. That's what we put to the public in America. Well, it would take nothing, just stand up and talk to each other. That's, that's incredibly simple. You just have to make sure that uh, everybody is, is listening to each other. Um, consensus. Uh, it's hard to get interna the international community to agree on anything. Uh, we're gonna have to look at the, st all the stakeholders involved and try to reach a compromise. We really all need to find a common ground and a common stance on, you know, just in general, regardless of religion, race, you know, culture, we all need to decide together what's the important values that we should uphold. And that would be, I think, the first step in being able to make a difference, you know, internationally or even nationally in your own, you know, home, definitely. I believe in the uh, power of everyone coming together and if there is a large enough cause that, um, everyone will just band together and you can accomplish anything in huge numbers. I mean, unification in general, I think that's what everybody wants and everybody wants to achieve. So once everybody kind of pulls together, which slowly but surely is happening, I think something can happen. I mean, I don't know the full thing, but I mean, world peace. <laughs> With calls from the UN Special Coordinator for an end to the Israeli Gaza Strip blockade, we asked our experts to speculate how much more needs to happen before there is an international response to Israel's actions. It's easy to, to draw parallels when you see on television, for example, white police officers uh, beating and oppressing black protesters. Um, the thing in Israel, though, is there are different tiers of racism. Um, you certainly have racism and discrimination against Ethiopians in Israel. But that isn't as bad as it can get because Ethiopians are Jews in Israel. So that's not the worst of it. Worse than that is the discrimination suffered by African migrants because they are not just black, but they are not Jewish. And the worst of the worst in the eyes of Israeli are Palestinians. They face the worst level of discrimination. So you have different tiers of racism. And while, while Netanyahu has come out and said, well, we have to stop racism, he really means just racism against Ethiopian Jews. He would not say this in regard to Palestinians because he's in charge of a government and previous governments that actively pursue discrimination against Palestinians. As the siege on Gaza enters uh, its eighth year uh, in a row, uh, the people of Gaza are still suffering due to the um, you know, silence of the international community, the conspiracy of silence. The people of Gaza are dismayed by the apathy of the so-called international community. They blame the United Nations for not taking serious action on the ground to prevent Israel from continuing its attacks against the Palestinians to force Israel to lift the prolonged siege. And I think the, the people of Gaza also put the blame on regional countries, 
for not intervening to put an end to this suffering. Um, the goal of Israel's siege on Gaza, the naval blockade, the land blockade, the air blockade, is actually to force the Palestinians to raise the white flag and to convince them that it is the Palestinians that should be blamed, not the Israelis. Now Israel controls Gaza's airspace, territorial waters and border crossings and restricts the imports uh, into Gaza. For example, the reconstruction of Gaza has not started yet. Tens of thousands of residential homes have not been built yet and this is due to Israel's refusal to allow enough quantities of uh, cement. So it's a way to break the will of the Palestinians of Gaza who resist, who fight for self-determination, who call for the right of return, who call for the release of Palestinian political prisoners, who call on, you know, they are calling for simple rights. They are not calling for, for things. Nowadays, people are suffering from frequent power cuts. The water in Gaza is not, it's not suitable for human consumption. Poverty and employment is very high. People live in the world's largest open-air prison. And I think the siege has failed to fulfill Israel's goals. People are still persistent, they are still steadfast, they are struggling, all attempts imposed on them uh, to submit. And the wars in Gaza, the first war, 2009, and the second, 2012, the third, 2014, and who knows, it could be another, a fourth year, a fourth war. So all these attempts have failed. The Palestinians of Gaza are still there. They, are, they live in their territory. They refuse to leave their territory to become refugees again, like what happened in 1948. And I think that those who impose the siege of Gaza should reconsider their stance, they, uh, rethink twice before they you know, um, stage another attack again in the future. Aggressive military action, the indiscriminate killing of civilians, abuse against children and racism are all things that would make headlines in almost any other country. But when it comes to Israel, it seems the world is intent on ignoring these breaches of human rights. How much more will Israel be able to do before it is challenged by the international community? Sadly, the answer is measured not so much in unjustified days of strife, but rather in the tragic death of innocent Palestinians.